Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to um, present some ideas about the applications of systems thinking for designing services. Um, my interest in systems thinking began with the book called The Fifth Discipline. When I was doing my bachelor's studies, I was uh, completely disconnected uh, from the courses I was going through in the program because I couldn't really find any meaning in them, any, uh, let's say, potential applications in what I was experiencing personally and professionally in life. And um, finally, we had this course about systems thinking in which this book uh, was used as a textbook. And for the first time, something resonated deeply with me. So I really became interested in studying and I pursued my uh, academic uh, undertakings more seriously after uh, learning some ideas about the systems thinking. So uh, my journey started with studying industrial engineering, and then I continued with industrial management um, back there in Iran. And I came to Switzerland around 12 years ago on a PhD scholarship from EPFL to do my doctoral studies in management of technology, which was um, in the intersection between management and engineering. Um, after this, I felt the need to deepen my understanding of systems thinking, uh, something I had worked on during my doctoral studies as well, but more on the qualitative side. I uh, did a second master's degree uh, in system dynamics, which is basically the quantitative part of systems thinking. Um, and for the past three years, I've been um, studying depth psychology at C.G. Jung Institute in Kusnach in near Zurich. So um, basically once building up some knowledge with the uh, scientific dimension of systems thinking, I realized I needed to deepen my understanding of the, the human part as well, because at the core of a, a human social system, uh, there is a human being that needs to be understood. Um, I have worked um, as an industrial engineer in technology transfer projects and uh, in car manufacturing sector. And I've also had the experience of working as a system dynamicist, working with uh, mathematical simulation models of complex and adaptive systems, mainly in the field of urban project dynamics. So I, I was part of a team that worked on uh, a city simulator for the city of London. And um, I also explored the applications of um, mathematical modeling for understanding disruption and delays in large programs. Um, currently, uh, for the past four years, I've been working at EPFL part-time to complete a book um, on the in, at the intersection between psychology, systems thinking, and design thinking. I've been a lecturer um, in the universities in Geneva and Lausanne area for the past 10 years where I've uh, taught a wide variety of courses, courses in industrial engineering, courses, beginning courses in computer science. And very recently I have been um, more focused on teaching interdisciplinary courses in particular courses on systems thinking and design thinking. And um, finally, very recently, I've also started working as an independent educator and consultant. I have started offering some of the courses that I used to offer uh, in the university programs and for um, students enrolled in university programs directly to participants that um, are independent. And uh, basically, they're not part of any university program. They, all, they only want to get some specific modules, something very practical, and uh, let's say professional oriented. So this is basically my journey. And in this presentation, um, I will draw on uh, the insights from the various fields that I've studied and also my experience as a lecturer. I hope uh, you find this useful. The first set of ideas I wanna talk about is wholeness versus fragmentation. It's, it's interesting to know that the word health has the same root as the word whole. So they're the same thing, basically. So understanding things in a holistic way can contribute to health, basically. 
right now we are in a world of interconnectivity. A lot of things being combined with coronavirus. We realize that things and phenomena that are uh, seemingly distant in time and space actually are not distant in time and space. We realize that we cannot isolate things. We cannot look at corona from only a health perspective. There is economic dimensions to it. There is social dimensions to it and so on and so forth. But the path we have chosen in education is exactly opposite that path, that vertical movement of interconnections and combination is being countered by a movement of specialization and isolation and separation in the way we are learning and in the way we are setting up our educational institutions. So some data for you from, actually this is from years ago, this may be double right now. So we have 8,000 disciplines, 50,000 academic journals and over a million articles published annually in uh, ISI index journals, only ISI index journals. Well, this is an age of hyper specialization basically. So two people from the same field cannot talk one another anymore. You know, in strategic management, we have different sub-disciplines. We have competence-based strategic management. We have resource-based strategic management. And the people, they have their own conferences, their own journals, and they do not find a way of reconciling their ideas under one roof together. There's this analogy of an IKEA furniture that I like a lot. What education is giving us right now is a piece of parts without an instruction assembly. So we, we, we learn about marketing, we learn about, uh, uh, for instance, organizational behavior. We learn about finance. Each of these have their own specific constituencies, but no one tells us how to assemble something out of this. Because if you maximize something for your employees, which is the subject of an organizational behavior course, you may minimize some value for your customers because they may be empowered to make mistakes. So we don't really know how to assemble these things. And sometimes these ideas cannot be fitted into one big picture. The same thing is with the goal setting that we have. We just divide things up. If you're familiar with the uh, sustainable development goals, we have 17 areas that are now divided into 169 sub goals. And the, the next thing is just to break those 169 also to sub sub goals. But this is actually not giving us any insight about the totality and the dynamics of the situation that we want to manage. Um, I have noticed the same thing in the field of, of design thinking and service design, the number of canvases that's, uh, that are being used now, you know, for anything, there's a canvas here and there, you wanna do this, okay, they're here, here's it's more like patches that exist, but there is this whole picture view, which is uh, lacking in a big way, in my opinion. Um, in my classes, I do this ex experiment with my students. I give them two bottles of Evian, not Evian, just like bottle, a bottle of water. Uh, in this in this picture is Evian, and they're big bottles. And I ask them to to big uh, to make a bridge that allows the bottles to pass underneath it, and also can hold the weight of the bottle. The bottles. What p students normally do is that they quickly erect the pillars of the bridge. And then they, they ask me, excuse me, how can we connect this? So building a pillar, building a column is something which is very natural, but forming the connections is not. And then I tell them the moment you're building the pillars, you should think about the connections. You cannot build it up and then think how I'm going to connect this. As you're putting those blocks, you should think about the way these pillars need to be connected. Once they get this idea they can build bridges that can withstand much more than the weight of the bottles basically so this clearly shows that connect creating connections and seeing interrelationships is not something that is very natural for the students this is not something that they have exercised i um one of the systems think here that, I, that, is, that is one of my favorite uh, philosophers as well is russell akoff he says a system is a whole that cannot be divided into independent parts with loss of essential properties or functions. So if you divide it up, something essential is lost. You cannot just break it down without losing that essential property. He also says that if you optimize a part of the system, other parts will sub-optimize. So it's like a house. He says you change a room in a house only if this change can make the house a better house. So you subsystem optimization results in systems of optimization, basically. This is another important idea in design. 
Then he talks about uh, synthesis and analysis. He says in analysis, we break things down. We want to understand the constituent elements of it. In synthesis, that, we, that which we want to understand is first identified as a part of one or more larger systems. So there is a really a philosophical assumption which is different here than how things are being practiced in the field of design thinking and service design, in my opinion. So a number of important assumptions about what a system is and what is this approach to thinking and how is it different from analysis. If you go to architecture, I think architects are very good systems thinkers and Acuff was also uh, an architect by training. And um, basically he has this, uh, there's this book called The Timeless Way of Building. If you're interested in design, I think you, you should look into this book. There's plenty of great ideas there. And one of them is this uh, phrase that I've sentenced that I've selected for you is that in in this approach of time, the timeless way of building that is described in the book, the author is saying that every individual act of building is a process in which space gets differentiated. It's not a process of addition in which performed parts are combined to create a whole, but the process of unfolding like the evolution of an embryo. So if you look at a service like this, a lot of things change. It's not a part of components coming together, forming something. It's basically something bigger that needs to be looked at as an unfolding process to see then how this big thing is going to be differentiated and uh, in, a, in, a, in a actually in a, in a way that is um, that keeps those connections or those big pictures in mind. If you look at literature, there's amazing insight in literature as well. Um, here's a part of a poem by T.S. Eliot, one of my favorite poets. The second part is in the first part as well. It says, the endless cycle of idea and action, endless invention, endless experiment, brings knowledge of motion, but not of stillness. Knowledge of speech, but not of silence. The second part, where is the life we have lost in, in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Where is the, you can go on, where is the information we have lost in data, basically. So if you think about this, the whole field of data science should change because in data science, we try to put data together, create information, analyze or interpret information, get knowledge, and then out of that, hopefully get wisdom. But the idea here is, how could we define the big picture or the perspective in a way that we do not lose touch with those essential properties of the system that ACOP was talking about in the first place? If you have an analytical lens, you break things down, then putting them together is not an easy thing. The analogy that comes to mind is the blind man and the elephant. So if you wanna assemble an elephant based on the uh, observations that each individual has from a segment of it, then that is the elephant uh, that is going to be perceived by, by the observers. And another analogy that I like is a, is a broken mirror. You can never have a perfect reflection in the mirror by putting the broken pieces together. So trying to get wisdom out of putting disconnected pieces of uh, data together is something that reminds me of these analogies. The other idea that I want to share with you is about causal tracing, connections across time and space. This is something that I think would be very useful because you use ideas like or tools for problem framing in, in, in service design and problem structuring. I think there is something fundamentally uh, different we could do about that using insights from systems thinking. So this is one of the applications that I want to share with you. The idea is that we start with something which is observable like in, we call these things events. Then we ask ourselves, what is this event a part of, basically? What is the pattern that generates this event? So if we can contextualize the event, if we can find the temporal and the contextual dimension out of which this event uh, emerges, then we can go to the next level, which is the patterns that give rise to this. The next question to ask is that, what is the underlying structure that is generating this trend? And finally, what is the mental model that creates that underlying structure? So four levels of analysis we have here. If you wanna analyze things, if you want to start, for instance, framing a problem or, or trace a problem causally, then these four layers are important. I give you an example. 
from Amazon, which is a, one of the companies that I've researched a lot. Um, there is a number of very interesting cases there. So here you can see the, the share price of Amazon fell to something like seven bucks. Now it's 500 times more uh, after. So this is around the year 2000 when this thing happened, 2001. Um, if you look at the annual reports on Amazon website for the year 2006, there is an interesting article attached. The only year that has four attachments instead of three attachments that are the proxy statements, annual report, and the letter to the shareholders. In the letter to the shareholders, there is a nice phrase that I wanted, a nice paragraph that I want to share with you. This, Jeff Bezos says that in 2000, we invited third parties to compete directly against us on our prime retail real estate. That is when they opened Amazon Marketplace. So that was the first marketplace business model that came to existence. So bringing the competition in so that anyone could go there and sell their books alongside Amazon Books. And that was something that had never been tried before in any other platform. So it seemed risky. Many people thought that it would cannibalize Amazon's retail business. However, our judgment was simple. If a third party could offer a better price or, or better availability on a particular item, we wanted our customers to get easy access to that offer. That's their judgment that they had. That's the mental model that they had. This is the mental model that we have. And so if you go back to this picture, the mental model is if it's good for the customer, we're gonna do it. Now, what can we do which is better for customers? Reducing prices, increasing availability, putting into place the structure, this structure is a marketplace model. What are the patterns that emerge? Well, customers can have access to secondhand books. They didn't have that access because Amazon was working only with publishers and distributors of new books. Or some uh, sellers can offer prices that are lower on the books that are offered by Amazon. So what is the event? The customer up there is feeling thrilled because they can get a book that they can't find anywhere else at a price that they can't find anywhere else. That's an event. So you can see there is a thought, there is an idea at the bottom. There's, a, there's an assumption down there. And this assumption gave, gives rise into a structure, a, a, mo a business model, an operating model. And then trends emerge out of that. And those trends can be observable on the surface based on uh, an interaction, an instance of interaction of a customer with the service. So um, the article that I would recommend any of you to, to read is called The Structure of Unstructured Decision Processes by Henry Mintzberg, to me, one of the most credible uh, scholars in the field of management is Henry Mintzberg. And it's, it's great. It talks about the type of decision-making situations that uh, people face in strategic, let's say, uh, uh, management. And it's a very important distinction about the type of decisions and the decision processes that exist in companies. Very, very interesting article and interesting enough for Amazon to attach it so that their stakeholders, their shareholders could understand their mental model. They, they can understand where this thing comes from. And there's a precedence. There is an idea that supports it. Otherwise, it would have been difficult for some of the shareholders to understand why that thing happened. Another idea is a typewriter. We can have, we can see different type of, let's say a typewriter or a, or a keyboard. And then we can see all these layouts that are the same. So did the person who came up with this over a hundred years ago see it all coming? That there will, there will come a time that there will be no physical keys and no physical mechanisms for typing, but the layout he created was so, so perfectly designed that was adaptable to all future incarnations of keyboards that were yet to come. So again, we can see what type of a mental model he had. The idea at that point was to minimize repairs. So the, the words that were, the letters that were used frequently together were, as, were spread as much as possible so that they're not typed at the same time. So there is no jam in the levers uh, for, the lever, for the letters. And therefore we have this structure of QWERTY keyboard and we can see it across different patterns. Uh, and the users interacting with that will be an event. So looking at this um, reminds me of uh, a, a part of a book, which is also an awesome book. Um, it's called The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's not about Zen, it's not about motorcycles. It's about the way we see our surrounding and the way we can uh, interpret our observations. A very nice book. 
two parts of it is beautiful. Um, really a book about systems thinking without calling it a book on systems thinking. So if a, if a factory is torn down, but the rationality which produced it is left standing, then that rationality will simply produce another factory. If a revolution destroys a system, systematic government, but the systematic patterns of thought that produce that government are left intact, then those patterns will repeat themselves in success in the, in the succeeding government. There is so much talk about the system and, and so little understanding, and this is so accurate. And finally, he says, a motorcycle for the author is a system of concepts worked out in steel. He sees ideas that are carved out in steel. He doesn't see parts. So anywhere we see anything physical is basically an idea that has found a form of manifestation in the outer world, in the physical world, a psychic reality that has become a physical one as well. And that connects us back to this idea of uh, mental models, structures, patterns, and events. But the next question that the psychologists in the field of analytical psychology try to answer is, where do thoughts come from? Where do mental models come from? Because that's not where we stop. This is the continuation into some deeper and darker dimensions that really generate all those assumptions and the systems of thought, decision rules that we have up there. So we can get this thread and follow this thread down like a detective to really understand something fundamental about uh, the psychology of the designer, the psychology of the user, and so on and so forth. And this to me is real systems thinking, going back down, so diving deep and then surfacing again, repeating, this re repeating these actions so that we can have an understanding of the factors that stand in interrelations. Um, Next idea for you, this is the one before last, so I'll try to finish in less than 10 minutes so that we can have some questions and answers as well, is the idea of the maps and territories. So the map is not the territory, we have heard that. Donella Meadows has a beautiful sentence. She says, everything we think we know about the world is a model. Every language is a model, maps, statistics, books, databases, equations, computer programs are models. None of these are the real world. So. Anything we learn is a model basically at university. Then the map is not the territory it represents. And, um, but it, it, if correct, it has similar structure to the territory, which accounts for its usefulness. And this connects to what George Box says. He says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So um, wrongness is a part of model because there's abstractions and generalizations in the model all the time. Otherwise, the model becomes as complex as the territory and therefore it's useless. But I have um, some observations. The models we use in design thinking are basically static, static ones in a dynamic world. I haven't seen models that keep track of a variable over time, how things change over time. I've seen some customer journey maps. That's good. It's crap, it somehow tracks some interactions of the customers at different stages of, um, but we don't really track an actual variable here. So what is it? What is this variable of focus? What is this essential property of the service that we need to have, keep an eye on? Because there are a variety of patterns of, let's say, behavior that can happen over time. And our models are incapable of giving us insight with, with respect to that. That's one observation that I've had with the, in the world of the models that we use in design thinking and service thinking and service design. So back actually the model is not matching the territory. The map is not matching the territory in most of the cases. Um, this is a picture I took uh, from one of my recent trips to Vietnam. As you can see the prices here, so without eyes is 2,000, a little eyes still 2,000, half eyes is, is sorry, 20,000. And then when it's full eyes, it, it just falls down to 15,000. So this is, we're living in a world full of nonlinear dynamics. And most of the cases, when we look at things, um, we look at them in a very linear way. So even when we look at behavior over time, our mental models are very linear. And this somehow impedes our, our understanding of understanding thresholds, tipping points, after which something important happens, different type of st stable 
metastable or unstable equilibrium that we, we can have in the use and adoption of a service uh, or of a product will be all left out because this dynamic, nonlinear, all, chain, all uh, changing according to time property is left out of our models. Um, what we do in systems thinking is we work with feedback, feedback loops. We understand reinforcing feedbacks and we understand goal seeking or balancing feedback. And then we understand how these things can be combined with delays. If a delay comes in, it gives us an oscillation. If we buckle a reinforcing and a balancing loop, then we can have an S-shaped growth. So different, a wide variety of things. Or oh, how about now a reinforcing, a balancing with another balancing? So we start with something which is very small, understanding a pattern of causality between a set of variables. Then we start building around it so that we can form a big picture view of the situation and somehow gain some insights into the dynamic patterns that may emerge when the system is actually interacting in an environment. And uh, basically all this comes from the field of uh, control systems and uh, dynamical systems, something that came in the 19th century basically. So these, are, these have been existing in the world of engineering for many years or uh, decades. And then in early 1960s, uh, they were introduced in the world of socio-technical system or human social systems by the work which was done in the MIT. And so this reminds me of the statement by Wolfgang Pauli, um, who says, what is still older is always the newer. So these things are still around and they're they're used and there is great applications of them that could be explored in my opinion in a more fruitful way in the field of uh, services and design basically last idea is basically um, um, the beginning part of a book called by uh, written by don gods and gerald weinberg called exploring requirements it doesn't call it service design or design thinking, but there's great ideas for designers there. I highly recommend it. They talk about the man who made a living out of a product which was called the guaranteed cockroach killer. So when you bought the product, you were given two blocks and um, a set of instructions that read like, place cockroach on block A and then hit cockroach with block B. That is the guaranteed way of killing the cockroach. To me, a lot of the models that are used are being used are really in that spirit of guaranteed cockroach killer because a lot of work is in problem structuring. How do you structure the problem before jumping into a solution? How do we really understand we, we have a good level of basically understanding uh, the dynamic nature of a problem, the contextual elements around it, exogenous, endogenous factors and the people that interact with it. So answering, um, the question of why do we model or what type of models we should use, I always bring up the idea of byproduct effect. This is something that I hope I'll be known for at some point. That's why I just put a copyright sign up there so that no one copies the idea, but it's not yet copyrighted. So uh, what is a byproduct effect? In a world of design, when there is emphasis on significance, in meaning, in uh, let's say something which is beyond uh, the world of physical stuff, something that is, there is subjectivity embedded in it. There is meaning finding embedded in it. I think we need to use models that can help us reach a level of byproduct effect. The models that can help us become better observers. We can understand nuances. We can find meaningful similarities across seemingly different phenomena. And we can use the models to boost our intuition, to, be, to become better learners. In my opinion, a model, the purpose of modeling is not solving a problem. The purpose of modeling is basically developing an understanding, uh, generating some insights, learning more, boosting intuition, something that you could not have otherwise achieved. So, uh, for me, model building, especially sy systems thinking or the models that emphasize the relationships are real good tools for developing intuition. And intuition is perceiving with, with means that are beyond our sensory, the five senses that use the sensory inputs that we have. 
it's something, it's something that connects us to something mysterious, to a place where ideas come from, a place where there is wholeness, where things are not yet fragmented or not boxed. So developing the intuition of the designer, I would say, should be the, the first task of any education process that is geared to uh, basically uh, design thinking or service design courses. And finally, uh, this statement that I love from uh, an architect car called Dennis Laston says, our job as, as designers is to give the client not what he wants, but what he never dreamed he wanted. And when he gets it, he recognizes it as something he wanted all the time. So this is intuition. This is not something you can go uh, distribute survey questionnaires amongst the users. Okay, what do you want? Tell me what you want. I'm going to build it for you. That doesn't work like this. I, I would say design comes from a mysterious place, uh, comes from a place which is connected to our intuition, our feelings. It's designers to me are uh, hunters in that unknown space. They go into that unknown space and they come out with ideas for design. Or as David Lynch calls that place or calls the process of ideation or finding ideas, says it's, it's a process of catching fish, going under the water and coming back up with a fish. So uh, these are some ideas uh, about where I come from and more or less a more or less out. So I cannot call myself an outsider because I've also worked in, uh, in the world of services and design thinking, but I've always tried to assemble my own material that comes from different sources. I've never used any book which has, which is, which has the word design thinking or service design in it. Because I think it's a, this field is an interdisciplinary field. It's a cross section of different roads. It's not a road on its own. And with that analogy, I'll um, end my presentation. I'll be very happy to answer your questions or hear your comments or thoughts.